Great. Hey guys, they've got stream fixed and stuff. Oh, okay. Great. Good. Good. All right. Great. Captain Lewis, I want to welcome you on behalf of the City of Aspen and the Aspen City Council to Aspen. Thank you very much for making time to come with us and, and uh, make a presentation this morning. Uh, as you know, we're in our city manager search. And for those that are here in the audience and those that are watching, uh, this is the first interviewee that's going to be doing pr presentations here. Other candidates are um, doing panel discussions right now, and they will also be joining us later in the day. But we welcome you and thank you for kicking this off for us. If you'd like to start your presentation, you are welcome. Thank you very much, and I'd like to start by thanking you all and the community for attending today and for the time and diligence you're putting into this search. I really appreciate it. It's been a very intense process so far, and that just goes to show how committed you are to finding the candidate that fits for your community. So I'll start with an introduction of myself, why I'm interested in this job and why now, a little bit about my leadership philosophy, and then my method of decision making that I'd like to apply to the Aspen Area Community Plan policy that you asked us to select. Um, I'm originally from Colorado. I grew up in Colorado Springs and went to college at Colorado State University. I grew up with a family condo in Frisco and skied every weekend. We, were, we are a very outdoorsy and active family. And my parents live in Carbondale, as does my brother and sister-in-law. So we have family ties to the Roaring Fork Valley and care very much about this community. And, and I already feel like I know quite a bit about it because of those family ties. After college, I moved to Salt Lake City to be a river guide and a skier and lived in the town of Alta and got my law degree at the University of Utah. After law school, I was uh, working at a big law firm that actually was hired by the town of Alta to be the town attorney. So I really started my legal career doing municipal law and spent about six years as the town attorney, also doing real estate transactional, business, finance, um, very complex negotiations on renewable energy um, as a business transactional attorney. And from there, I moved to Salt Lake City where I am an in-house lawyer for the municipal corporation. And I really view myself as a jack of all trades as a municipal attorney because I touch on every topic that the muni municipality faces, both big and small. So we deal with constituent concerns on sidewalks all the way to very big First Amendment issues, large affordable housing and mixed use development, bonding for uh, large-scale infrastructure, affordable housing, economic development, arts and culture. I was the lead negotiator on the city's $120 million Broadway-style theater that we have in downtown that we're very proud of and has really changed the face of our downtown as an arts and culture mecca. So I have a, a, a deep and technical skill set in municipal operations. And in the past few years, I've really been thinking about my next step, knowing that I have a real passion for being a public servant. And, and I've realized that I also, I love to lead teams and I love to, to help the city and guide the city in not only its legal issues, but its policy and business. And so I have been, been wanting the opportunity to be an administrative leader. And this city manager position really really is all the puzzle pieces falling into place because of my family ties to Colorado and my municipal skill set and, and really what the city of Aspen is looking for with technical expertise in transit, affordable housing, big picture policy issues, um, you know, coming in and, and making some really interesting and exciting changes for the city. So uh, I'm hoping that, that I will be a good fit for your organization because I have a lot of passion for the things that I hear that you're passionate about as well. Um, my leadership philosophy really is tied to my value set and, and the way that I live my life both as a private citizen and a public servant is through accountability, transparency, integrity, and empathy. And that's how I would be a leader for your city. I think that it is absolutely imperative to have open communication both between city staff and elected officials and also the community at large. Um, I, I very much value being an, an empathetic and warm and open leader uh, who really takes all, all opinions into consideration and, and, but then once the decision is made, is accountable and, and decisive and, and willing to take responsibility for those decisions after they've been made. So with that introduction, um, as I was thinking about, about the Aspen Area Community Plan and coming in as 
an outsider to the community and trying to understand what your needs are and address them with some creative and, and exciting solutions, I came up with the model of listen, test, and decide. And what I mean by that is, um, well, well, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about listen, test, and decide in a second, but what I decided to address today was housing. and. The reason that I picked housing is um, because it really is, as I view your community, again, as an outsider, but as somebody who is, is sort of thinking about what your needs are, it is the thread that seems to tie all the other policies together. So when I looked at your, your plan as a whole, there are, um, there's commitment to environment and climate change, transit, um, the, the community as a whole, diversity, the lifelong Aspenite. And, and the tie to all of that is how do we house our residents, our workforce, our seasonal workforce, our, um, our community from top to bottom. And, and what I see when I'm looking at your community is that in a lot of ways you're, you're at a tipping point and it's, it, it's important to figure out what your goals are. Now what I want to emphasize is I am so impressed at what a trailblazer Aspen is in affordable housing currently. And as I looked at the policies and the, the commitments that you've made to housing a diverse community, um, there were things that I thought, wow, Salt Lake could really learn a lot from this because you are really ahead of your time. So how do you take those commitments that you've made and bring them to the next level? And I added this chart to my PowerPoint. It's a little bit hard to read, but it comes right from the Aspen Area Community Plan. And what I thought was so compelling about it is that the, the commuters and the workforce coming into Aspen, um, the urban growth boundary, is increasing and the need for affordable housing, and here we are looking at 2008, so we're 11 years past that, is doubling and the amount of free market residences is decreasing. And so you really are at this point where how do, how do we provide for all of our community? I, I know that you all know this, but this is as I'm, I'm looking at this from, from an outsider's perspective. So applying, listen, test, and decide to the housing policy. I am new to the community and my first commitment will be to earn the trust of your expert city staff, you all as elected officials, and the community as a whole. What that means is transparency from start to finish and it also means having an open perspective to every point of view. There are no enemies in this process. Everybody has a vested interest in the community and it'll be important for me to hear from everybody. Um, I also think that it's really important as a city manager to understand role clarity because I am not the policymaker. I am the, the leader of the entity who executes the policies that you all determine are most important, listening to your constituents um, and your stakeholders. So once we've done our listening exercise, which I will talk more about specifically applied to housing, we're really gonna to wanna to think about what do we do with that data and how do we make recommendations both to act quickly but not haphazardly because it's really important to uh, be able to address the problems in a way that are meaningful and that we don't have to take one step forward, two steps back and I've got some examples of that um, in my experience. And then let's make decisions and let's try things and let's be um, realistic about our goals but also creative and, and I'm hopeful that with my experience and the things that I've seen both in the town of Alta and Salt Lake City, I can come in with some new and exciting ideas um, to help implement your policy goals. One of the questions that we were asked to address was what does success mean to us in this process? And, and I'll tell you that for me, regardless of how many affordable units the city of Aspen develops, if there's not community engagement and we don't have the community on board, it will not feel like a successful process because we won't have, um, we won't have the confidence of our community. And, and what I've seen in Salt Lake City is sometimes when, when you take steps without effective and meaningful transparency and engagement, you might have a short-term success, but it really sets you back in terms of your trust of the community going forward. So it's also gonna be very important for me to build a trusted relationship with the staff. And, and that's something that may take some time because I'm coming to this community as a newcomer, so I'm, I will be very committed to that. 
and, and I'd like to see shovels in the ground. I was very heartened to hear that you've got approximately 270 affordable units that are going to be built, hopefully lived in by 2020. That's really exciting. I'd like to figure out what that looks like. I'd like to figure out um, whether whether that's the type of product we like, it's the quality and design we like, and, and really analyze um, what we can do with those units and, and whether we could, that's a model going forward or we need to change it. And then I was really interested to see that the Aspen Area Community Plan didn't actually set a goal for the number of affordable units in the urban growth boundary, and I wonder if we all want to revisit that. Um, I know that there is some talk of uh, housing 60% of our workforce within the urban growth boundary. I'd like to explore with you whether that's a reasonable goal, whether we should be setting a goal of a certain number of doors, what types of units those should look like. In Salt Lake City in the past three years, um, the, we set a, a very aggressive goal of 3,000 doors of affordable units uh, in about three years. Uh, we have not reached that goal, but we have reached 1,500 goals, and they were, or, excuse me, 1,500 doors, and they were the, the most difficult units to construct. They were um, permanent supportive housing, single room occupancy, or below 40% area median income. That is, th those are units that, uh, no developer really wants to take on, frankly, because there's there's no profit in it. And so we we had to really be creative in the way that we financed and incentivized those products, and we're very proud that we have those doors uh, built. And then I have a, a friend and a mentor who's been a city manager for a number of years, and he talks about the holy grail of local government. And for me, um, what that means is the city operating in a way that the, the citizens are served and don't necessarily notice that the city's operating. And that doesn't mean that they're not engaged because I understand that Aspen is a very engaged community, but if we are serving our community, we are not creating scandal, we are not on the front page of the news, and we are, we are providing for their, their needs in a way that's effective. And, and that to me is a real tenant of, of being a public servant and being a city manager. So another question we were asked to address generally are what are the challenges? And I don't think that any of these would, would come as a surprise to you all and to the community members. Um, you, you had an administration who was in place for 19 years. That's, that's a culture that's in place. And the first thing that I would need to do is understand that culture, repair relationships when they need to be repaired, and, and gain trust. And I'm just going to keep saying that over and over again because I can't do my job as a leader if I don't have your trust and I don't have the community's trust and the staff's trust. In terms of affordable housing, Aspen's real estate market is one of the most challenging markets that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I, I came to visit two weeks ago and saw a really cute um, Victorian home and thought, well, I'll just see how much that is, and it was not $9 million. So, <laughs> you know, there's... Uh, That's a buy. You're right, exactly. I, I should have should have bought it. Um, <laughs> so th that, that's a, this is a very complex issue, and, and it's, it's very complex with the overlay of that real estate market, because what I have been <clears throat> able to lead out on in Salt Lake City may not apply as easily here because we can't buy a piece of property for $250,000 and build single room occupancy homes on it. So I, I understand that challenge and, and I'm excited to work with it and figure out what, what solutions we can find. So <clears throat> now getting into the details of listen, test, and decide. The first step is going to be in, to engage in as many creative ways as possible. and. Uh, I'm really excited to hear that Aspen recently hired a community communications or engagement manager. I'll be very interested to talk with that person and see what creative engagement ideas they're thinking of. I also, you know, in doing research, there are a lot of stakeholders that I will want to meet with from the, the largest employers in town to the next gen advisory committee because I think there are ways to engage that will be different depending on who we're talking to. So there may be some uh, stakeholders who are really adept at social media and that's going to be the way that we're going to reach out to them. And there may be some who face to face meetings, formal facilitated sessions, or sessions that are much uh, less formal, a cup of coffee or a glass of wine is gonna be where we get our information. So uh, I'm excited to figure out what those engagement strategies are and immediately deploy them. What I've seen work really well in my experience 
is number one, recruit experts for um, the topics that you really need technical expertise on. And in Salt Lake City, we have a group called the Redevelopment Advisory Committee, and they serve two really unique roles. They advise, they advise the elected officials on big picture policy issues having to do with redevelopment, economic development, affordable housing, creative financing and incentives. But then they're also a very nimble group that provides specific advice on specific transactions and, um, and projects that the staff is working on. And we found that they are very effective in helping provide technical guidance and expertise that maybe we don't have in the city. So I'd like to think about whether we have those experts here in the city that we would want to utilize for projects that we're working on. Uh, there are also times when um, conversations are so emotional or intense that it's important to have a facilitator. And in Salt Lake City, we've had great, look, great luck on uh, a project that we call Block 67. Um, the Salt Lake City is broken up into grids and every block has a number. So Block 67 uh, is one of our big blocks downtown and we've got a developer coming in doing a very exciting and very innovative mixed use project that happens to be adjacent to the Japanese American cultural neighborhood. And the Japanese American community was very concerned about this development. And so with my advice and my help, the Salt Lake City Council uh, pumped the brakes on the project and said, developer, we understand that you're gung-ho to get this done and you're ready to put a shovel in the ground, but we've got a community who is very concerned about what's going to happen to their cultural resources and their heritage. And we brought in a professional facilitator to, to have conversations between the developer, the city, and the community. And it's resulted in great success in the city figuring out exactly what the Japanese American community needs and providing the resources so that they, they're protected and that their neighborhood is, um, is not lost. And then one of my core values and what I've learned being in municipal government for the last 12 years is that transparency has to be a baseline in everything we do. And the town of Alta, um, just as one example, um, had a very contentious land use application, uh, 26 acres being subdivided into single family homes right at the base of the ski area. And legally, they were only required to hold one public hearing and then make the land use decision. I advise them to uh, have many, many more public hearings than that. And it resulted in hours and hours into the evening, multiple nights of very emotional testimony from our, the constituents and the stakeholders. And not only did it help the council members really engage with their community, but it helped the, the developer understand what the issues were so that they could um, mitigate the, the problems and the issues that they had seen. And so it was, it was a successful um, transparency exercise. Also, the Salt Lake City Council cares deeply about transparency, as I know you all do too, and it really flows through their entire legislative process, from the way they agenda meetings, to the way they hold extra public hearings, to the way that they make decisions over multiple meetings so that no decision feels rust, rushed. And that really has helped uh, the community trust that they're listening and they're making their decisions based on um, everybody having a seat at the table. There are challenges to listening, and I, I don't want anyone to think that what I am suge suggesting is slowing the process down or reinventing the wheel or, or hiring a bunch of consultants to go over what, we've already, what we already know. Uh, in, in Salt Lake City, the, the redevelopment agency, um, when I first started representing them, really relied on outside consultants to do all of their work. And we brought all of the work in-house and were really able to engage with staff and the, the community in a way that was much more effective. And so what I would like to see applying my experience is listening while also executing on projects and figuring out what the low hanging fruit is. So the city is currently a developer of affordable housing. Let's keep those projects going. Let's engage if, we, if there are things that we need to change about those projects because maybe they're not the right design or they're not the right types of units. I don't know, but let's have that conversation, but also continue to have the listening exercise and exercise um, and hear what the community is saying. One um, sort of 
war story is in Salt Lake City, we had a project on State Street, which is sort of the equivalent of Main Street in Aspen. And a really exciting developer came in and had a great multi-use, affordable housing, retail on the first floor, mid-block walkway project that he, you know, is about a $40 million project. He was all ready to develop it. The redevelopment agency conveyed the real property to him. He sat on it for four years, declared bankruptcy, and was in bankruptcy court for another two years, and the redevelopment agency bought it for $4 million out of bankruptcy. And restarted the project. <laughs> so the lesson that we learned from that is set realistic goals and expectations and do your dil due diligence up front because it's a lot worse if you have to redo it again and have a property sit fallow for four years in your urban core. Um, I also think that it's important to do a, an audit of our code and figure out if there's low-hanging fruit or gaps in the code that we could amend immediately. And one example in Salt Lake City is we had a demolition of residence, residential housing mitigation process, but it was skewed so that the cash in lieu that the developer had to pay was much lower than the cost of building an affordable unit. And so of course everybody paid and nobody was building new units. And so that was a quick fix that we could change and I know that Aspen has worked through that and is thinking about that too. But really figuring out where our gaps are and, and making those changes quickly so that we can, um, we can be sure that we've got the resources at hand that we need. <clears throat> So then once we've listened, let's start testing. Let's, and again, I, I, I wanna emphasize that the council is the policymaker. So what I anticipate is based on your 2017 through 2019 top nine goals, the council wants data and the council wants information. That's what I hear uh, about what's working, what's not, where are the gaps in our affordable housing um, programs. I'd like to bring those to you and figure out what you'd like to do, and then let's let's get some shovels on the ground and let's test those ideas. Um, one thing that you may want to consider is some sort of a housing board. Again, that's I, I know that you have the the housing authority, but if there are people that you would like to bring in as resources to advise either administrative staff or the um, or the council, that may be something that that we could consider. Um, one thing that we've seen as a, a really great success in Salt Lake City is having all of the housing funds and incentives and loans and programs go through a one city department as a one-stop shop. Because what we were finding is we had a community and economic development department and a redevelopment agency that were both doing affordable housing and they were a little bit siloed and they weren't talking to each other. And so we, we have moved all of the housing programs into the redevelopment agency and all of the funding. One other thing that we have found to be really effective is to hire staff as essentially ombudsmen. And what I mean by that is a housing ombudsman that may sit in you know, the economic development department, but their job is to talk to all of the departments and divisions to make sure that everybody is communicating. Uh, it. So, so developers, when they come in, don't say, wait a minute, the building department told me one thing, but the planning department told me something else. Um, we want to be sure that that we are being consistent in the way that, that we communicate with the city and sometimes, or with the community, and sometimes an ombudsman can help with that. Um, I also believe that there are two ways that you could incentivize something that the city wants to do, like affordable housing. There's carrots and there's sticks. And what I have found is that the carrots work a lot better than the sticks. And so in, in Salt Lake City, we have implemented an expedited per permitting process for affordable housing and also aggressive fee waivers for affordable housing. So we've got impact fees, building permit fees, um, and, and then a variety of other sort of plan review fees. And if people come in, with affordable housing in certain levels, then in some cases they, they may get fee waivers. Um, a, another thing that has been fascinating to work on is we have uh, identified areas of high opportunity in our city. And what that means is the areas where um, affordable housing typically isn't built. It's the more affluent neighborhoods and we give additional incentives to developers who build affordable housing in those neighborhoods. Or those neighborhoods. That's a little bit challenging here in Aspen because you're such a, a small town and your urban growth boundary may not allow for that, but there may be areas where we can think about um, that we'd really like to focus our development and provide incentives in those areas. 
The other thing that the city does is we bought a lot of real property and um, we offer write downs of the property value to developers, sometimes to zero. So we give the property away for free. But what that developer commits to us in return is very detailed commitment to design guidelines. Uh, it, sometimes it's as detailed as the, you know, the type of siding, the type, what the, what the units look like, good design and good quality. And I've been thinking about that as I've been reading about what you all are, are talking about in terms of affordable housing really being um, how you define community. Because if you've got somebody who lives in an affordable unit, but it's kind of dingy and they don't want to live there, then that's not their home and they may not stay. And that affects your community. But if you have affordable housing that's good design and that it has enough space for their family to grow or for them to actually build their home there, then that, that becomes part of that thread that ties your community together. And so there are opportunities there to, to really require the design. So finally, let's make some decisions. And so, some things that I've been thinking about is, you know, initiating code, code changes, <laughs> thinking about taking immediate action and shovels in the ground when we can, and then thinking about the city internally. Are there structural and departmental changes that we need to make? In my experience in the past uh, three years with the redevelopment agency, it made, the city m made some enormous structural changes to how that city department operated within the city. And I was really on the front lines of those changes. And it was very painful for the staff. And I would never recommend change for the sake of change because I think all that does is create confusion and, and you lose trust and you lose the motivation of your staff. But if there are holistic or surgical changes that we need to make within the city so that we've got departments that are working together or that aren't siloed or that are communicating together, then, then let's figure that out and, and make those changes so that we can be operating in a way that builds trust with the community and um, and that we can trust each other. Some, some ideas that I had about decisions we may want to think about. I've talked a little bit about mitigation, cash in lieu versus on-site construction. I know that Aspen is working on that. I've, I've seen your code changes. And, uh, but if there are things that we need to do to really um, incentivize building more affordable housing on-site in the urban growth boundary, let's think about that. Uh, ADUs I know are a hot topic and that really ties to VRBO and short-term rentals. I know that your ADU ordinance, despite the fact that the community plan suggests removal, I know that you revised your ADU ordinance and you're really requiring it as a place where people live on a more permanent basis. Let's talk about whether that's working, whether it's being enforced, whether there are other tools that we can use for ADUs to be part of our affordable housing portfolio. Uh, finally, I, I have a lot of experience in redevelopment agencies in Colorado. They're Colorado urban renewal agent areas, excuse me. That's the tool there is tax increment financing. That's another way to incentivize people um, to build affordable housing and the revenue stream doesn't come from your general fund. It comes from tax increment. So there's some ideas there that I'd like to think about and explore with, with you all. And then, of course, enforcement. I, I know that that's a struggle. I know that your housing authority is, um, that's one of their main jobs. But let's, let's think about whether it's working, whether it's not working, whether we need to hire more staff on the city side or help the housing authority. Because r really, if, if you've got, what we have seen in Salt Lake City is if we've got land use restriction agreements or deed restrictions, but nobody's paying attention to whether they're being enforced, then all those incentives that you gave to the developer or all of the reasons that you did it um, are not actually working the way you want them to work. So in conclusion, I'm very excited to help you continue your trailblazing record of being affordable on the front line of affordable housing. And uh, you know, I'd like to do it through the model that, that I just suggested of list and test and decide. And I think the, the things that I can contribute to it are my leadership style, my open communication, my integrity, my accountability, and my experience. And, and I really look forward to the next steps with you all. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. We do have just a few minutes. So if there is um, a follow-up question um, from council members, we have time for maybe one or two. Uh, I'm going to start to my left, Ward. Well, you mentioned three 
three things that I'm interested in the outcomes were block 67 was that NIMBY or cultural or um, the Alta development of 26 uh, acres um, and that there were multiple public hearings or uh, meetings on that and State Street uh, multi-use um, the what the outcomes were on those three because the, um, and particularly on the State Street how do you uh, how do you guarantee a development is going to be completed mm -hmm. once it's been approved? Sure, <clears throat> those are great questions, thank you. Uh, I'll start with Block 67. That project is currently in development. Um, it was not NIMBY. The, the Japanese American community had uh, multiple temples right next to the Buddhist temples right next to the, the proposed development and it really is their neighborhood core. And they were very concerned about the way the development would face the, their temples, um, trash removal, parking, um, ingress and egress of big trucks. So what the facilitated conversation has resulted in is the redevelopment agency giving the developer an incentive to build underground parking. That's what he came to the city for. So that incentive remains in place. But part of that incentive is actually going to be escrowed by the agency for the develop so to it, to require the developer to put in the parking mitigation, the trash removal mitigation, and the truck traffic mitigation. And if those things don't happen, that developer doesn't get that incentive and the redevelopment agency is committed to constructing those things themselves. So that's how we we have resolved that issue. It's a, and it, it will be written in the contract with the developer um, and also with the city and the redevelopment agency. Um, the the town of Alta with the 26 acre uh, subdivision, the the town ultimately denied that land use application for a variety of reasons. In Utah, the legislative body can't deny a land use ap application based on what the courts call public clamor. So just because the community doesn't like it, you can't deny it if it's legally permitted. But there were reasons. There were serious problems with water delivery and um, fire access with that development. Unfortunately, that development uh, is actually still in litigation. So they, they sued the city, and here we are eight years later, and they're still litigating it. But the process was very effective from a transparency perspective. Um, the State Street project, uh, the redevelopment agency is very excited about the new developer for that project. They put out a very comprehensive RFP after repurchasing it from foreclosure. And lessons learned, uh, what, what, what I advise them to do and what they have done is actually recorded restrictive covenants on the property right now requiring a certain number of affordable housing units and other sort of design elements. And that's non-negotiable for the city once the financing and other recorded documents uh, are um, recorded. What that means is if there's ever a foreclosure, those priorities for the city and the redevelopment agency will remain on title for any other developer. And so that was a way for us to really say, it doesn't matter who owns this, we like this new developer and we're, we're confident that they're gonna get it done, but heaven forbid they declare bankruptcy and we have to go through this process again, we don't necessarily have to buy it to control the development because our restrictive covenants will always be in place on the property. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're gonna just take one last one if okay. we can. And if, oh, thank you. Um, you mentioned that uh, when you're building affordable ho housing, you want to develop something that people actually want to stay in and, and right. isn't just a, a placekeeper. Um, affordable housing is part of creating a, a, a stronger community. What are the other factors that you see that, that need to happen to create a, a cohesive, strong community? Other than housing? Yeah. yeah. In addition to what, what do we need to add to housing? Sure, Great sure. You know, I think that it's it's really a lot of the things that I see that you've already listed in your Aspen Area Community Plan. Transit is enormous. Taking care of our citizens from cradle to grave is enormous because, um, you know, if you only have 
one demographic. So if you only have young families, but you don't have seniors <coughs> or retirees or vice versa, then you're not gonna have a diverse community. So I think it's really important that, that you view all of your, your constituents on an equal ground. Um, environment is an enormous consideration and something that Salt Lake City really struggles with because we're, we're in a valley like Aspen, but we have terrible air quality. And so our community suffers and, and our lower income community suffers more because of that. So it's really imperative that the local government is thinking about the solutions that it can implement to take care of its citizens from a pollution and a climate change and environmental perspective. Um, I also think that economic development and arts and culture is critical to the community. People want to live here because of those opportunities. You don't want empty storefronts. You don't want uh, to be pushing out local business. Um, you want, you want the, the citizens to be able to get what they need in their community because that ties to your air pollution if they're driving up and down valley. That ties to your, your transit issues. So all of those aspects of, of what makes a community able to sort of provide for its citizens and the local government's role in that are, are what makes a community what it is and what makes people want to stay for their lifetimes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I have a question. Ms. Lewis, thank you very much. My pleasure. We hope you have a wonderful day today. Great. Great presentation this morning, and we will see you again this afternoon. That sounds great. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks have a great so day. Much, thank okay. you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, I think we're going to be taking a few minute break while um, presenters get changed out. Um, right. So take a few minutes. All right, Not welcome maybe. back, guys. Um, <laughs> our next presenter is Sarah Ott. Sarah, on behalf of the city and the Aspen City Council, I welcome you and thank you very much for taking part in this process. The floor is yours. Thank you for having me this morning. And for those of you I haven't had an opportunity to, I know time's important, so I'm going to set my own little stopwatch here to make sure I stay in my allocation. Uh, those of you I haven't met, I'm Sarah Ott. I'm the um, current interim city manager here in Aspen. And I came to Aspen in 2017 as your uh, assistant city manager. Moved here with my family of two young children, at uh, now one at the middle school and one at the elementary school here in Aspen. And how I came to public service is sort of a, an, an interesting path. Um, it was early on for me. I had some required community service requirements uh, when I was in high school. And from that required community <coughs> service assignment, I was assigned to the town hall and I met my first city manager, a guy named Phil Hanzi that I'm still good friends with today. And uh, Phil really showed me the opportunities that came that you could actually get paid to help people realize their vision for where they live. And, and that was really um, personally satisfying for me. And so I've been fortunate that my undergraduate studies at Ohio Wesleyan University uh, is focused on urban studies and political science and sociology. And then I completed a master's degree specifically in public administration, local government management at the University of Kansas. Since that time, I've come up through the ranks as an entry level uh, public servant to serving as the chief administrative officer known as a township administrator in the township form of government in Ohio uh, to to serve communities helping them realizing these visions going forward. Uh, I, I think I can help you here in Aspen move forward on a lot of things and one of them I want to talk with you about today is housing. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I, I came into the housing world here for Aspen um, pretty quickly in December of last year and, and have spent quite a bit of time um, trying to assemble uh, a pathway really to go forward with the energy that the new council is bringing to this issue and to the dialogue that's happening here in our community right now. I also feel believe very strongly in this program. I think it is a critical element of Aspen's history 
and deserves a, a very high level of engagement going forward to keep that momentum into the future. When we talk about housing, though, I think we're having a struggle as a community. And I think the struggle is around equality, equity, and inclusion. And we're not sure how to balance those quite yet in the conversation. We, we want to equally apply regulation so that development mitigates uh, for its employee ge generation. We, we need to check our assumptions about all those that work here, how many really want to live here as part of this community. And we also need to have a conversation about when we look at development, about the role of mass and scale in the density question. I don't think we've solved those questions together as a community going forward. One of the challenges we have is, is our reality is, is that our zoning code and our site-specific land, land use entitlements um, mitigate in different ways. And that gives us angst, I think, in the public policy conversation. I also think that we're looking for equity. We already have some of it. Our, our program offers its tiered categories based upon economic means and household size. We also, though, exempt certain activities and business types from mitigation mandates, like our small lodges and our nonprofits. At the same time, we're also looking for inclusion in the program, and how do, we, how do we achieve inclusion when we're trying to balance equity and equality, when we want to increase our, our year-around housing, but at the same time, we recognize this is not a problem we can build ourselves out of. AACP for years has recognized that that's not a problem we can build our way out of. We also want a multi-generational community, and we're trying to figure out how to meet the needs that range from uh, what housing stock is needed to the quantity to go from everything from our recent Aspen High School grad to the young family to the retired ski instructor and all those possibilities in between. And I think we, we all recognize we're, we're struggling with supportive housing, that there's overall just a lack of it in our, in our subsidized housing program. So how are we addressing the needs of those who are, are, are full members of our community who may be having cognitive disabilities, may be dealing with situations that currently have them unhomed, might be um, in, in a moment of transition in our community, perhaps maybe they're moving out of a domestic violence situation, in emergency housing. We don't have the programs right now set up to address those needs that are growing here in the Upper Valley. I want to offer you some ideas from my view of the AACP about how we go forward from here and how we do this with our current limited finances um, and our limited land. Those are our two limiting factors, I think, in this whole conversation. Um, and the AACP recognizes those um, going forward. And I really think when reaching that balance, we have to start with validating the current vision and philosophy of the AACP. I think this thing's spot on from a vision statement from where I sit. I'd be interested in knowing if the council or the community agree with that. But if we're, we believe that the fundamental cornerstones of this community are a year-round workforce that is viable and healthy, is critical to the Aspen idea, that we need to make sure we're investing at a level that actually makes that happen. I, I think that the council table needs to, at the council table, that is where this first conversation of just reading through those statements and just saying what resonates and what doesn't starts. And from there, I think we start a, a limited community engagement process that validates or invalidates that vision and that philosophy. And we have to recognize there's a community, there's a continuum to community engagement. I think we, as an organization, and as a government entity struggle with this, about when are we on the informing end of the scale versus when are we on the empowerment end of the scale, when are we in the middle? And we need to be conscious ahead of time of where on that scale engagement around housing and the AACP's vision and philosophy should be. There will be pieces of the housing conversation that require different levels of engagement to be effective in moving the public policy conversation forward. I personally use a, a resource that's focused on trust building and strength building. This um, visual that I'm showing you right now is the National Standards for Community Engagement for the country of Scotland. Uh, and, it, and it's really a circular wheel about how do you create inclusion, how do you create support, what methods are you using, and what impact do these pieces all have together in how you move forward on the engagement continuum. 
this is a training piece as an organization we should be spending more time on, I think, to help validate the AACP's uh, philosophy and vision in the housing area. And I think you take something from this, and how do you take it from this conceptual level and put it into practicality of day to day? I, I really think there needs to be a listening tour around housing. And by listening to her, it's really going, going out where people are. So whether it's going to the rotaries, whether it's asking and hanging out at the yellow brick at the time of parent pickup, meeting people where they are to get some of their input um, on where they see the housing conversation going. Uh, and then there needs to be some prioritization. And I think the community can, is a vital step in the prioritization. Today I'm going to present you to you what I think the priorities are, but those should be amended or validated or invalidated from that community engagement process. So you've already heard me previously talk about the three-pronged approach, and I want to go into it in a little more in depth with you today about how I think we move this portion of the AACP forward. Um, it's our financial advisory board getting it going with its scope. Um, advancing engagement in new construction, and then prioritizing the policy work at the council table and influencing the priority work at the APSHA table. Let's talk a little bit more about the financial advisory board. They, they really have three roles, to evaluate, to investigate, and to advise the council through recommendations. What, by this, what I mean is, is, is that the advisory board really should be evaluating the current funding sources and the volatility of the RET and what that does for the continuity of our housing priorities for the long run. The conversation about new revenue sources should come into that. There should be a discussion about the pay-as-we-go versus debt financing um, options for the council to consider. And there also needs to be a review of the financial policies of the current housing development fund going forward. In terms of investigating, I'd really like to see the Financial Advisory Board consider the methodology that's used for pricing the value of expiring deed restrictions and to do a more in-depth analysis on that particular piece. I would like us to look at ways to, through them, to increase market inducement for more private developers to get involved in the housing credit program. I think that's a big gap we have right now. I also want us to have some evaluation from this group on the merits of use, using the evolving and changing public finance tools and tax credits. There's a lot of pros and cons with these financing tools and tax credits for, for, for housing, affordable housing. Some of them come with strings that are so long they may not be worth it for our community, but we need some folks who can really dive into that and, and analyze and, uh, those strings and what the pros and cons of that are for us going forward. For advising, I really would like the Financial Advisory Board to advise the council and making sure we're doing, getting our bang for our buck on our existing resources and how we're deploying them from where they sit. And I also would like them to um, provide some guidance on where their thoughts are on balancing the capital reserve needs versus um, the replacement needs that we have coming up versus the new inventory question that, that is coming online right now. Um, all of that might result in a recommendation that says we need, to, we need to address the revenue stream or that maybe uh, some of our other partners need to help address the revenue stream. But I think that this is the right group of the folks that we have who currently serve on this, as well as the additions that you've recommended are absolutely one of the ways we should go forward. The second thing I think we need to do is to continue our engagement on specific projects and move them forward. We've got a pretty hefty build schedule for the next seven years. 225 plus new units are in the pipeline right now in the next seven years. That's a substantial commitment of the community to the community to deliver those units and I think it's a huge resource going forward but we've got some policy issues we got to work out before those units are delivered and these are coming online right now for example with Aspen housing partnership construction that you've seen this summer um, I, I think that we, we continue the the housing partnerships this summer we need to advance Burlingame um, phase three for the multifamily component absolutely and we need to continue the community conversation around the lumberyard um, one of the things that's been real interesting is, particularly around the lumber yard, is, is that we're using a different engagement process than we've used before. Um, before we would be to the point where we had concept drawings, we had figured out general densities and all of that before we'd present them to the community. This time we said, let's stop before we do that and check in even further about what is the community's expectation of this parcel? What kind of experience should it deliver to the neighborhood that's going to come from 
this particular development. So we've seen that not by having open houses, but by going out. So going to the next gen, going out into other groups and saying, what's your input on this particular project? I think that more personalized approach is yielding us better information to inform decision making when it comes back to your table um, here later this year. I also think that we need to <coughs> continue on Water Place to not only to address the city's own employee housing program, but for us to advance it with partners that allow it to be constructed in a timely manner. And that has, you know, the continuation of the conversations that I've had with Aspen Valley Hospital and the Aspen School District on their needs and their interest in helping explore that particular development, how it could support them while also not having additional transportation workforce impacts given the nature of its location. The other part of third prong approach is the prioritizing the, the policy work. Um, we've talked a lot about HOA reserves and you need to get somewhere. Um, I've read through a couple of times the, the county's proposal versus the city's proposal and then that died off. And, and the, the fundamental difference is whether we agree to having a, um, a revolving loan fund or a cash payment. Um, uh, that's the crux of the conversation and it's a big number is the difference between the two. My initial reaction is the revolving loan fund so that folks have a, some skin in the game is important, but we need to see what that does to affordability. Uh, for sure, there's a lot more analysis that needs to be done in this area. Um, the APSHA board's excited to be engaged in this conversation again is, is my, my sentiment from individual conversations with those members. Um, but we, we've got to move that one forward even while we're checking in with the philosophy component and the vision component of the community. I don't think we wait on that particular piece. Um, I also think on the mitigation policy, we can move forward. So what are the preferred mitigation rates by the council and its public policy? Um, are, are those that are there now correct? And are the exemptions that you provide to that mitigation rate exemptions you still wish to provide in order to meet other community objectives. And here's an example of one that's gonna hit you next week is around um, childcare. And uh, site-specific exemptions that exist on the yellow brick um, site within the existing building confines. Um, should though, if we increase the density of childcare opportunity inside there that will generate more FTE, does that need mitigated? Or is the community goal of of uh, providing the child care, the higher priority for the funds within the Kids First Fund. Um, those are the kinds of, of tough questions that are coming to us related to this particular issue. I also think that we need to move away from the case-by-case -case consideration when it comes to mitigation and exemptions. I believe this is a negotiation tool that's used in the pro forma through the land use entitlement process. I think we should be more upfront and meet the community's expectations and the council's expectations that mitigation is built into your performer from the beginning, that it's not an afterthought and it's not a negotiation point um, for you uh, as a developer or applicant later in the process. The, the next thing I have on there is the fee and lieu update. I think this is, is key. You actually um, are gonna be getting an update on it this month. The, the, the reason why I think we have to do this is twofold. One, we have a legal obligation to have a fee in lieu option, but secondly, it drives some other policy conversations. And I'll give you an example here in a little bit about why we need to know this number. Um, the, the next thing is the affordable housing credit program, for my view, that we need to do a, a more in-depth analysis of this program. Um, not only what, how, what do we need to do to entice more folks to, to get into it, but is it being effective enough? What are the challenges? What are the modifications? What are the education? I'll give you an example, lender education that the city may be able to provide that will help entice more people to get into this program. Well, I think we have a, a limited exposure with this opportunity that we could really build upon going into the future. Um, and then the, the last item I have up there towards tangible progress has to do with APSHA. We are at a fantastic opportunity point with the new APSHA board. They're gonna be working hard on their next five-year strategic plan and we should be going through the AACP's um, specific um, action steps and saying, 
which one of these makes sense to be on ACRA's work plate versus the city's work plate? And how do we then position encouraging those getting into the five-year strategic plan at APSHA? Um, one of the things that I think is actually a little unrealistic of the AACP is the amount of things that were expected of APSHA. Um, it, it's a pretty long list, and there is not the organizational capacity in the way APSHA is currently funded or structured to deliver on all of those um, within a 10 or 15 year time period. So it's either going to need to be a resource supplementation or it needs to be a decision that that work stays at the, the city level to get those done for the community. So I, I just want to walk you through a little bit more about how from prioritizing the policy work that gets into other more granular situations. And the one I want to talk about is the fee and lieu update. The fee and lieu update is directly related, in my view, to the downsizing incentive. And you might ask, well, what's the relationship there? It has to do with how do we set up the conversation to get started. Behind the scenes, staff and I have been working on a proposed methodology for systematic, making a systematic process for downsizing incentives. Um, the fee and lieu number is critical to starting to put on what is the avoided construction cost of a bedroom. Then it brings that conversation to some place that the APSHA board, that the city council and the BOCC can start talking about, okay, you downsize one bedroom, we think that cost X based upon the age of the unit, <coughs> depreciation, excuse me, and the, the what's gained for it in terms of mitigation and are we willing to take what would have been construction dollars and at some point turn those into a incentive to free up that space to increase the occupancy levels in the existing housing? I think this is a really important foundational work that, that the council and APSHA need to be able to say what is the right incentive and how do we structure that to be enticing and how do we have the, this uh, as a, a simple but effective way to communicate with those who might be considering downsizing. So this work here I'm showing you now, it, it still needs flushing out, right? I'm just conceptually trying to show you why this is really important, but how we're applying it at the staff level right now in our decision um, conversations that we're having. Sorry, that scheme, screen refreshes occasionally there in front of you, Rachel. Um, and then I think there's another piece of this where the AACP specifically talks about category and unit mix. And if you recall the Greater, Greater Roaring Fork Regional Housing Study, did some of this work. We need to translate that actually into what we're building in that 225 units that are in the pipeline in the next seven years and bringing that back to you in a more concrete unit mix that makes sense for the site and for what we're hearing as the community needs right now. Um, all of this doesn't happen without a resource ask. So I felt like I should tell you that now just to where you see my thinking's at right, right in this area. Um, for, <coughs> excuse me, for the financial advisory board, I think it's somewhat minimal, but it's consultancy work with our existing real estate broker, um, our uh, um, bond council, our cities of financial advisors all need to be part of those conversations with that body and with you going forward. So I see that as an incremental increase perhaps over existing relationships. Um, one of the things on the engagement and new, new construction is that I think that we need to look at creating some more capacity for the policy work. And by doing that is moving some of our construction pipeline to an owner's representative more quickly. So rather than um, adding staff permanently for construction over the next seven years that we, we continue the owner's rep relationships to do that. Um, and again, those would be awarded through a competitive RFP process to identify who those folks are. If you recall, we currently have um, contracts out for community engagement right now uh, in both of those projects. And then the, the, price, the prioritization of the policy work, there's gonna be some help we need from development specialists. So when we, we have conversations around um, zoning changes, for example, um, what does that actually look like and what do we get for some of this new zoning code changes that would come as part of this process? Um, I do think we need some additional in-house staffing for the analysis work on policy. Uh, for example, um, part of this proposal here freezes up some of Chris's time, but the reality is, is, is that when the other assistant city manager left, we, we lost about half of, 
half of FTE that was doing high level technical policy analysis in the housing arena as part of that position's responsibilities. And that is something I've not been able to devote that level of time to in my own schedule here over the last several months. Um, and then lastly, I expect a resource request from APSHA for developing their five-year strategic plan. I really don't think that should be a staff-generated um, process or plan. I, I think that, that that process is going to require a, a heavy lift and staff is a supporting role but not the leading role in the facilitation and the design of that plan. The APSHA board certainly has final say on that, um, but I suspect there will be some kind of resource request that comes with how they choose to go about their plan and I think we should be very open and supportive of that particularly when we have items that that you will consider um, wanting to advance in that plan more quickly than others so I'm gonna finish and turn it over to you thank you very much sir um, we do have a couple minutes for follow-up questions from council members uh, this time I'm gonna start to my right Any oh questions? I was gonna say Oh, I got to ask a question last time, Rachel. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask Ann's question because it oh. was so good. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, housing um, is a critically important issue, as you know, and um, many of us ran on housing and the community is uh, very engaged right now. But what other components and what other things outside of housing make a secure and healthy and engaged community? What other elements? Uh, would you see as critical in relationship to the AACP or more broadly um, uh, however you'd like to answer it okay uh, you know I think the child care one is the quiet crisis in our community um, and since I came here I, I, I supervised kids first directly once I once I arrived here two and a half years ago and I think there's more awareness coming here but the fact that we have 50 infants a day who are not in high quality care um, is frightening very frightening to me um, and I think it is affecting our um, um, social economic indicators in the community um, by not having options for families. But the other thing that I, I think besides child care as a community is that we have, we have some learning to do as an organization and as a community about how we want to communicate with each other. This somewhat goes along the civility um, um, theme and that ensuring that we're delivering professional, reliable information to the community in a timely manner, and that when we engage, we're setting the conditions for civility and for honesty and for positivity in those conversations. And I think um, in my time here, I've seen some real hurdles um, and real mess ups in that arena. Um, Hopkins Bikeway is the one that sticks out to me as one that I was just woke up one day and I was like oh my gosh what are we doing um, uh, I wasn't in a place where I could influence it at that time I, I believe as an interim city manager I have started influencing some of that but we have a lot more work to do thank you other questions Skippy do you have a follow-up um, yeah I mean I guess I could just follow up on that um, just in the realm of communication you know the kind of the uh, the wheel from Scotland, et cetera. It, since you've taken over, is there an example of uh, uh, outreach or engagement where we've engaged with that model or done something different? And if so, what was the result or change? Sure. So I have not introduced that model to staff. I don't think they're ready for it. And also, I wanted to be respectful of whomever the next city manager is and what their philosophy around community engagement might be. So I didn't want to introduce something that then might be in conflict with, with a future manager. Um, however, some of the changes that I do think we've made is, um, and I'll go back to the lumber yard as an example of the early engagement on a major community issue going forward. I think you saw, um, I would say almost over engagement. No, I wouldn't say almost. It was over engagement from my view on the recycling center. Um, and then we missed the mark on some others that have come through. Uh, the, the challenges is that we have had a very decentralized model and that has resulted into inconsistency for the end consumer of information. We need to fix that. Um, I have some thoughts on how to do that. I s save those for tomorrow, um, but if you want me to go into those today, I'm more than happy to. We can save them for tomorrow, I think. Okay. 
do have a question if we have time. Oh, we do. We oh, have okay. time. Um, yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Um, when you're talking about mitigation and exemptions, how would you approach an overhaul of, uh, of the mitigation, the exemptions as negotiations, including fee and lieu, uh, taking a look at, at how we're handling all those aspects of affordable housing? Sure. So, you know, fee and lieu has to be an option, but it doesn't have to have the same uh, value in the conversation as the others. It can be the option of last resort and have a specific process that gets us to that option um, that extinguishes the on-site mitigation. Um, I think generally we've said on-site mitigation, then off-site, and then, then fee and lieu. Um, the, that should be reaffirmed. I, th I do think we need to reaffirm if that is indeed the, the community's position okay. and the POC Council's position, and we go forward with that. The other piece of it is is that you know this this is truly a policy conversation about the small lodge preservation versus the mitigation with them. That is a tough conversation for for the community to have because of trying to diversify our our lodging opportunities in the community and how do we how do we if we if we're going to require the housing mitigation, are there other ways to improve the small lodge program to still make it appealing in a way to, to engage in it? I don't know that we've ever been able to have the freedom to explore that conversation um, in the community development team, uh, but I, I think they would welcome the opportunity to do that. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Ward, do you have any follow-up questions for today? Um, I think you've expressed a pretty broad understanding of the AFSHA program and Mike? housing. Microphone. Mike's back there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm appreciative of the uh, depth of your understanding of the APSHA program and our housing needs. Uh, I wonder if you would comment on um, the IGA as the executive director relationship between the city of Aspen city manager and the APSHA board. <coughs> Um, sure. So I won't answer that under the umbrella of the AACP because I think it's, it's a very specific question you have. The, the, the notion of where should the executive director report is very much a philosophical one, I think, for the 15 elected, sorry, not the 15 now, where are we? Um, the, the 10 elected officials and four community members that, that make up the new board. My concerns about where the executive director report has to do with the control of assets. For the assets the city has financed at taxpayer direction and ensuring that whatever reporting structure is in place, that those assets are protected and maintained in a manner that's appropriate. So for example, the traditional way we've done this is having the deed restrictions run with APSHA. My question is, is that right going forward? Should those deed restrictions run with the city of Aspen, of which APSHA is then a IGA partner to administer those deed restrictions on behalf of the city? So there's tools out there to mitigate some of the concerns I have, but those are some of the fundamental concerns I have regarding that. And the second piece I would just put on it is, is there needs to be a conversation about what kind of control the council or the BOCC wish to have when they are the primary funding organizations of APSHA? And do they wish to, to relinquish some of that control um, through this new reporting structure? Do they feel like that's sufficient when there's now elected representatives there helping make financial decisions? Thank you. Sarah, thank you very much. Thanks, Hope you have a wonderful day today, and we'll see you again this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we'll take a few minutes break, of course. Get in. We have actually a long, extended break between this and the next presenter, so um, I think we will. Ten forty-five. Understand the agenda. <laughs>
Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We are back once again. We have our third presenter of the day for the City of Aspen City Manager Search. This is Rob Etnire. On behalf of the Aspen City Council and the City of Aspen, we want to thank you for being here and welcome you to Aspen. Uh, we have a 20 minute presentation plan followed up by a few questions from us perhaps, and the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, Council. I appreciate this opportunity to talk with you and talk with the community and get to know you a little bit. Uh, the Council's asked me, like the other presenters, to give a little bit of background on myself and then uh, why community management, and then talk a little bit about the uh, Aspen Community Plan in a particular area to focus on. And that's all I'll do here for the next 20 minutes. So the question that was put to me is public sector. Um, what's your experience in the public sector and community management and why are you here today and applying for this position? And tell us a little bit about your, your background. I think you may have seen a little bit of my background. The last 10 years I've been working in a community management organization uh, as the community manager uh, with a large uh, resort association in Truckee, California called Tahoe Donner. Uh, my uh, role in that, uh, of being the general manager there, is really more than just working with the organization that's Tahoe Donner, the staff, uh, the community members there, but it's really about working for me with the large community base in Truckee as well. From the nonprofits to the local government uh, to the county seat government, it's really about finding those core values that are important to us all and integrating those into our organizational goals and objectives to work together as a strong, cohesive community. And personally, I find that tremendously rewarding, and I'm fairly passionate about the leadership associated with being involved in a community and as a community manager. Because you don't get to just work within your own organization, you really work across an entire community to try to integrate a lot of different ideas and priorities and perspectives into what's in the best interest overall for the community as a community leader. And that personally uh, drives me and is part of my passion and what I do professionally and just in life. It's something I've, I, uh, I find a little bit of a calling for. So let's focus a little bit about the Aspen Area Community Plan 2012. Um, I think it's uh, scheduled to go out to about this year and then it's probably due and probably in the process of updating a little bit. Um, but it was great to look at it. It's a great core document to get to know this community and what's important as far as uh, specific values and history of the community. And also uh, the appendix in the back really outlines several steps about how to achieve those visions. I'm going to focus today about the Aspen idea. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about this community goal, this collaborative initiative, it doesn't all fall under the authority or general duties assignment of just the city, uh, just the city manager. I think this is labeled appropriately a community goal in the collaborative initiative because you need to um, work within a larger construct of an organization and follow certain key principles that I've outlined here about identifying the initiative, identifying those things that are in the appendix in the back of this plan and tying those together with oversight, not just within the city staff itself, but within the community uh, organizations. And what is that oversight and what is that iteration of oversight and what are the expectations and how we communicate and our achievement to the plan against those expectations. And I think that's tremendously important as we look at this particular aspect, not just of the Aspen idea, but of all those as aspects of the overall community plan and our internal city plans as well, whether it be council priorities or city priorities um, or how they integrate with other priorities across the community. And then constantly, you're constantly reviewing those priorities and uh, achievement against those priorities and initiatives. So the Ask Me an Idea, uh, I imagine you all are a little more familiar with it than I was walking in here, other from an outside perspective, living here, uh, being here, living this. This is an amazing uh, document to read, particularly the Aspen idea, because it's so well entrenched, I think, in the culture of this community. You have very eloquently described how you want to live in this community and what your expectations are of the cultural norms of this community, which is great to see. And I imagine a lot of this section of this overall plan is going to continue forward. Um, and there are some challenges with that, I know, but I think uh, this is tremendous. This is the outline of those ideas that are described in there. I'm going to focus a little bit on civic engagement here as part of my particular focus on, on this uh, Aspen idea. 
We have some uh, existing measurements the city is using, and they do an annual survey called the Aspen City Survey. And one of the things I found in there that's uh, jumped out at me is a little bit of disconnect over time, and most recently about expectations of the community, of achievement, and actual uh, what is being achieved. And maybe there's a lot of reasons behind that, whether that's communication, whether that's a standard of what's being achieved, or just how it's being perceived uh, from an outside perspective there definitely is a statistical dip in that um, expectation achievement from the community's perspective in the survey. <coughs> so I'm gonna talk of what I think uh, part of this is, is you know, very simply a communications gap. It's described in a lot of different literature and a lot of different organizations, uh, but this is just simply the way I'll describe it. And it's a communication gap. And you know, I took a photo of these, these four rascals here on uh, the, the screen there, and I asked them to smile. And that's the photo I got. <laughs> so clearly, they each individually had a different idea about what <laughs> that meant to be happy and smile for a picture. It literally was a, that fast a picture at Lake Tahoe. And the, individually, they demonstrated their own personality, what they wanted to do. So there was a little bit of a communication gap between me saying smile for the camera, for the photo, and what they actually did. Now, that's not a disastrous communication gap, right? It's just a fun photo. But the photo below it shows a little bit of different perspective. Two people that are good friends, that have been friends for years, out doing something. I said, hey, tell me how much you love this meadow and the snow and this great snowy day. And they both did exactly the same thing without saying anything to each other. And that's created a little heart with their hands. They were very synced. They are very harmonized in what they were doing and how they, their relationship and what they were thinking about when I asked them something. And those are two very different experiences for a very similar kind of situation. So when I think about this gap of, and I just randomly put these dates and these numbers up here, but I think trying to marry a little bit about the past mm -hmm. statistical survey and the citizen survey. When there gets to be a gap of expectation of achievement or productivity or success in the community, and they express that in the survey in a certain way, and that gap grows considerably, in a short period of time between what they say is actually being achieved, that delta is what often creates a lot of community disharmony. Mm -hmm. And whether that be on a particular focused area or just in general. This particular area I'm talking about was from those previous slides that the citizen survey related to perceptions of achievement of council or management um, and certain staff functions within the city of Aspen here. And I'm not trying to be critical about that. I think it's great you have this data. The survey itself is amazing that you're actually doing it and collecting this data. Uh, there are a lot of different ideas about survey techniques and how often, the frequency, and the way you do that. And we could talk about that all day long, or I'm happy to talk about that all day long. <laughs> <laughs> so there currently are uh, I1, I2, I3, and I4 are the principal areas in the appendix in the back of the Aspen Area Community Plan 2012 that outlines four uh, major areas that we are trying to achieve, and there's some goals set against that and milestones set against that. I would suggest that from my reading of the plan, there's probably should be a fifth one, and that's the 1.5 I have under that one bullet there. And it really is talking about what tools do we have in place here, and I was really happy to see and read and meet earlier that the, the city has hired a communications uh, manager person here on staff. And I think that is a great step, I think, in the right direction of an ever-growing, changing, dynamic information culture that we live in today. That uh, while my father still uh, loved his flip phone uh, for a long time, he finally <laughs> upgraded and got an iPhone. Um, you know what? He used it just like the flip phone. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's a different generational approach to perhaps uh, the fact that my kids have a nicer, smarter, faster phone than I do. Uh, and they use it very differently in how they socially engage and interact with their friends in their school. Um, and those are big gaps in methodologies of communication. And understanding those and building the right systems and tools in place as a city here, as a city government, to make sure both council priorities, staff regular operating relationships with the community, are constantly checked in on. So we try to constantly close that gap of expectations and a delivery uh, to make sure we either raise the standards of delivery or we manage the expectations to some degree too. And it's a little bit of both probably. Um, I think that is probably a valuable potential community goal that I would weave into the Aspen Area Community Plan 
that is critical not just for the Aspen idea, but I think it's universally true across the entire plan and any organization and community. And that's not just what you read in the local paper, that's what we do as a conservative effort across all the different outlets of information that we have and our communication styles and our communication engagements one-on-one -on -one as community leaders, as community citizens, to understand and appreciate what is going on constantly. Here's a past survey I've recently worked with a private group on at my current organization at Tahoe Donner where we went out and I've, I've looked at the citizen survey and it's really you know, taking the same kind of a, approach of this dynamic survey, annual survey, and maybe making it a little bit more frequent and maybe shorter, but being able to build on valuable data that you already have that's robust and that understands and appreciates what's happening in the community. This community, much like the community I'm in in Truckee, has the same resort seasonality uh, type of atmosphere both in actual visitors and in ownership participation and when they're here. It's a lot of folks that aren't here most of the time and then they're here at certain peak periods of time. And this kind of reflects from a, uh, a survey perspective of owners in my community telling us when they're there. I have statistical data on when they go to the fitness center, when they're uh, eating at restaurants, when they're doing stuff because we have a large robust database that we have a lot of information in. And it's tying that information with actual feedback from the community to understand what is happening at a baseline level and how that constantly evolves and adjusts over time due to a lot of different standards of expectation. And it's not just when uh, the roads close because it's heavy snow. Uh, it's not the changing patterns activity based on that, although that's one circumstance. It's changing patterns activity based on uh, the entire Bay Area school programs. When do they have holidays? Understanding what that is and what the, how that relates to the ownership interest in the community and the citizens of the community, because that influences greatly when they come and play. A tremendous, and so that helps us tailor our staffing, our organization, our programs around when we see those peak periods happening and how they adjust on a regular basis. You know, where do individuals get their information from? How do they like to communicate? This is always a constant conversation that needs to go on because just like I talked about the flip phone versus the XR, there are different methodologies of engagement and communication. Uh, I love sitting down and, and reading the paper on Sunday. Uh, I read it digitally now instead of in print, uh, but that is kind of like my peaceful time on Sunday morning. Um, I like to get a lot of good, long, detailed information. Uh, other information I get on a very regular cycle on a regular basis. Certainly, I regularly is a working environment deal with an avalanche of emails every day. Well, most like most folks do nowadays. Uh, and I'm not talking about the spam. I'm talking about real emails you've got to answer and you've got to have thoughtful content to the reply. This is a response about how the 25,000 members or 6,500 owners of the community I'm in like to say they like to communicate in their interest level and the styles of communication. And if I talked to any one or two people on the street, chances are I would, I would hear a lot about uh, Nextdoor as an online community platform, about everybody communicates and prefers to communicate that way. But when we asked them in a survey, they really said that's not their main method of communication or how they want to receive information. So it's balancing those two understandings of what we're doing and creating resources of time against with communication and what individual citizens are saying, how they like to receive information. And it definitely adjusts constantly. So overall, uh, thinking about how we, um, you know, the Aspen idea, a communication standard, uh, I would say across all those different uh, goals, whether they're organizational goals, uh, council priorities, weaved in with the organization's goals, the Aspen area plan. We have multiple different documents with multiple different milestones and measurements. How do we review, establish an overlapping pattern of those so we can be an effective organization to deliver results on a timely basis that are measurable, that are clearly seen, and how do we communicate that? Both how do I communicate that with the council to meet their expectations, and how do I communicate that internally with the staff, and how do you communicate that with the community at large? I think these are some of the basic aspects of that. It's establishing standards, establishing dates, establishing deliverables, uh, agreed upon goals, and then constantly reviewing those action plans. 
Uh, I'm not seeing all the action plan deliverables right now in the appendix. Uh, a lot of them are very broad based, long term, and I'm sure there's some documents around. I just haven't had an opportunity to review those yet. But having very deliverable milestone and metrics associated with those tied into other plans, if this is a community plan, then how, how are those milestones and expectations tied into other community organizations? Because you can't hold them accountable from a city planning perspective because that's all a collaborative relationship. But how do you prioritize that communication that their goals and priorities have milestones and objectives that align with that community collaborative of the plan to meet collective cooperative goals of progress against those planned ideas? Uh, this is a generic dashboard right off PowerPoint. And it's in Latin, and I didn't change a thing about it. <laughs> because I just wanted to convey that there are amazing amount of dashboard reporting tools. And I think it's a really great tool that both achieve communication between management and council that meets your high level needs of where we are, how are we doing deviating from the norm, and where are we going. And using these kind of good dashboards to communicate key information both to the council, internal to the organization, and then to the community at large, I think is critical. People generally are very graphically oriented. I love leading, reading the consolidated financials. I think that's probably one of the best documents you've got in this organization that tells me so much about the organization. But it, you know, most, you know, it's not very exciting. Uh, it's a lot of numbers, but there's a lot of text that goes in there with too. If you can translate that into a document that has some high level dashboards associated with it, even on an annual basis, let alone a quarterly or a monthly basis that helps tell you where we're going in a number of different areas, uh, I think that could be tremendously powerful. And I think I'm getting close to time. Um, I'll just wrap that up with, uh, or this up, with just, you know, it's, it's, it's really about an organization and leadership and management um, and a community organization. Uh, it's about constantly having a little bit of a tight stomach. It's about being on the edge of your seat a little bit and constantly challenge yourself and challenging those around you to be the best you you can be. And if you're comfortable always sitting back in your chair and relaxing and not really challenging yourself, I think we get lazy as a community when we get in that mode. And I think as much as we, I think this community has kind of the underlying values that I really subscribe to. And this community seems to me as an organization or a community that it's on the edge of its seat it's forward leaning, it wants to be on the leading edge of so many things. And I think that takes a lot of time and energy, uh, both collaboratively, individually, to help find uh, the best way to be the best us we can be as a community. And that takes individuals being the best us we can be. And that takes collaborative conversations, um, but it, to me overall that can produce amazing results if we get it right. But it can be really hard, particularly when there's a lot of interest in the community, a lot of diverse interest. And as much as we can understand and reasonably get through the aspects of storming, norming, and conforming, uh, we're never gonna conform, but at least we get through the storming part of so many different ideas. At least we can norm, right? As a community, as a council, as a staff, and you become so much highly more effective as an organization if we can do that, and that really is all about communication. And I think first and foremost, that is one of this position's jobs um, beyond anything else. And with that, I'll say thank you for your time and happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council, questions? Rachel, we'll start with you. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, very much, Rob. And I, I may not be phrasing this right, give me a little room here, but um, when you think about Tahoe Donner as a community and it's your homeowners, and I, I would imagine, but I could be wrong, that on major policy changes, the HOA or the homeowners get to vote or weigh in, and then you have fairly clear marching directions for your organization. Um, in Aspen, we sometimes have more that the minority <laughs> that that weighs in uh, becomes the marching orders. Or uh, you know, I, I don't know if if managing a citizen population base and working to fulfill their needs is the same as a uh, homeowners association where majority rule might make everything more clear. 
right. I, I, I don't know what, uh, do you have recalls? Do you have, uh, you know, yeah. uh, petition drives? How, how, how yeah. do you manage the, um, the fact that people don't always agree, no matter how much outreach you've done? Yeah. That, um, great question. And, and I don't have a perfect answer, but I'll try to attack a little bit of it to give you some comparison. So the community I managed is 6,500 homes. There's about 25,000 members. It's very similar size and scope to right here, uh, to be perfectly honest. Geographically, it's a similar footprint. Smaller commercial corridor than you certainly have here. That's mostly uh, located in the town, uh, down the road a little bit. Uh, but it's a very uh, mostly uh, second homeowner population from the Bay Area that has an amazing diverse group of interest. And they express those interests in a variety of ways. And like any community, generally you hear from a very small community of people that are very passionate about particular interests. And it isn't necessarily the widespread majority interest. That is as common here as it is in my community. Um, we often... Uh, try to uh, understand what those perspectives are and as much as we often will go through a ballot measure or a outreach measure of changing rules uh, example short-term rental rules over a thousand short-term rentals happening in our community right now and there is some uh, gray area entitlement to be able to do that activity in our uh, organization's bylaws and cnrs um, but we've never enforced or regulated or done anything with short-term rentals until recently and with just a few people who thought that was an important priority that priority was elevated to a council board level it was conducted outreach with the community said here's what we're thinking about doing and we received feedback on that and then we implemented that and now we have short-term rental rules and regulations uh, that are very mild in the big scheme of things but they're new and different I wouldn't say that the majority of uh, the voter interest voted on them at all. I think it was a council board decision uh, that they thought was in the best interest of the community. And I think it maybe represented uh, an interest of the community, but certainly it wasn't a 51% uh, voter interest. And so what we've tried to do with that particular kind of interest is have a lot of outreach associated with it and a communication with our community about what the plan is, what the rules would be, uh, community feedback to help us modify those rules in several areas. And now we're still in a process of implementing those rules and further looking at and designing potential changes to those rules based on community feedback and actually what we're seeing on the ground, execution of implement, enforcing those rules. So I think it's, is that a good example of, does that help? Uh, Answer. I, I think so. Um, but we have petition recall. 300 members can get together and sign a petition and, and, and have a re-election for any council member or board member. Hasn't happened since I've been there. I think that's a good thing. Uh, but <laughs> it's certainly it's a pretty low bar in our community, too. Um, certainly, I've heard talk of it many times. I've heard talk of uh, our organization succeeding from the town and forming its own local government mm -hmm. to get the tax base that we would like to see uh, spent the way we want to see it. And we've gone through certain planning efforts around that. Um, so there is a little bit of similarity, I think. Um, I think we have found, uh, and I like to think it's through really good communications, uh, a happier place of less divisiveness uh, that has shown up in this room only on particular issues and occasions it has. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a quick question. Uh, you were just uh, responding to that uh, by um, talking about the short-term rental uh, issue, if you will, that came up. Would you just take one second? Could you name two other uh, issues or items that you've been working on over the last year for your community? Um, we have been a major issue right now, we've been working on for some time, is our defensible space plan where we have uh, thousands of acres of uh, great forest. It's not pristine forest, but it's 100-year-old growth kind of forest since the logging days. And we have a serious concern of wildfire in our region. Uh, and so we have had a concerted effort to both maintain our own association property um, and also establish a standard where we require the owners to maintain their property. We conduct physical inspections of their property with our on-staff forester. Uh, we communicate them whether or not they are achieving or not achieving. 
Uh, we've moved from a um, initial four-year cycle of inspection to an eight-year cycle back to a six-year cycle. And I say six-year cycle, it means every property we're touching every six years or every four years. We're physically inspecting that property to say, you need to cut the underbrush, you need to trim back these trees. Um, and this is a this is a real issue for our community because we're asking, um, we're maintaining a standard of forest health that is pretty high and it's costly to maintain. Uh, the maintain took a lot is, you know, three to $6,000, depending on how you, well, you do your work yourself and haul it off or hire a contractor. And we're asking you to do it in a short window of time during the summer when you actually can do that kind of work in your property. That's, that's a little bit of a, can be a divisive issue with a lot of folks. Um, so that's uh, probably a second issue. Um, the other one we're dealing with right now is pricing. Uh, we have gone through iteration of trying to address the overall um, pricing within our organization of what you pay for services at different areas, whether it's uh, fitness access or past products from the golf course or peak period downhill ski pricing. Um, and we uh, have realized that ongoing cost increases uh, being in California, uh, both regulatory, minimum wage increases, healthcare increases, worker comp increases, insurance increased premiums, uh, particularly due to wildfires, we're expecting a massive increase this year. Um, so those are real cost pressures that, imp that impact our organization. Uh, part of solution for that is uh, we can pass it all on and kind of your tax assessment or we can use uh, a different approach where we pass some of it on there and some of it we increase user fees. So when we increase user fees, what we have traditionally historically maintained a two or three percent interest growth on over time and all of a sudden do go 20% growth on a fee or <coughs> mini fees in order to recapture uh, revenue to help offset cost, that is a real issue for a lot of folks. Eliminate uh, 70 and over over ski for free type products. Uh, now all of a sudden we're asking to pay a product. Six and under, used to ski free, now you're paying a, a pass product. Uh, those are things we've gotten a lot of feedback on the last year or so. But we're trying to find this balance between uh, only assessing in kind of a tax requirement, about 30% of our operating revenue needs, and generating the other 70% in our actual operations. So when we talk about price increases, that makes a big, huge impact on our budget to help pay those regulatory increases. Because as much as I'd love just to co cut cost, um, you can only cut, you know, we're a heavy personnel type of organization, just like it is here at the city. Uh, and those are real costs. And when you want to get things done, you need to have people to do them. And that costs money in a well resourced or not well resourced community based service organization. Thank you. And uh, so back to civic engagement. Mm -hmm. And you talked a lot about communicating through social media, uh, internet, websites, um, a lot of data collection. Uh, how would you approach a one-on-one -on -one person to person whether it's information disbursement or conflict resolution? Yeah, I, I think as a city manager you you're, one of your huge roles is communication. I think on a one-on-one -on -one perspective You have a lot of very personal conversation and and often I want to get as much out of that conversation as I'm communicating uh, I want to learn as much as I'm trying to get across and it's, and it's a two-way communication It's and I think that's hugely important whether it's me with council members uh, me with my own staff or other community leaders. Uh, I think you have to have uh, well-respected conversations, uh, professional conversations, and collaborative conversations. Um, and I think that is my style, and I think that is an important aspect of any successful organization or individual. Okay. That Thanks. Answer. Yeah. Okay. This side of the table, Skippy Ward. Um, I think I've got two. Which one is that? Right? Yeah. I, <laughs> Um, the hearing you talk about your current job, HOA, it strikes me as, you know, almost a private sec a private public hybrid type of a scenario. Yeah. Uh, and there's, they're talking about you know pricing and all that stuff. So there's always differing opinions. Um, but but there is an element to what you're doing that is more an executive private sector basis. That could be awesome because you can come in and teach us things that we don't know from a public model, um, but it also means that you may have blinders to a lot of the things that we do. I wonder if you could give us uh, some color, some example of what you might be able to bring here from that model and what things going in you know you're going to have to catch up on learning. Sure. I, I think the model, I think you've described the model I'm working with very well, Skippy. The, um, the hybrid nature of it, um, 
gives us a lot of opportunity to do things. Um, but I think we've always got to be balanced against being aggressive on the pricing example I talked about. We're still, in my organization, we're still a mutual benefit corporation, which a lot of people write off as, okay, you're a corporation. Well, when you think about mutual benefit, it really is we're doing things that are in the best interest of the community. And that's not easily defined sometimes. And so what I, my approach typically has been trying to find uh, what's in that right balance of interest in the pricing model, for example, that is affordable to a wide swath of our community, not a uh, immediate draconian shock as a change. And it, what I've tried to do is try to uh, take reasonable community-based common interest approach to that model of pricing, for example, which I think is very similar to what you're operating here. Mm -hmm. um, there's certain realities of addressing costs, and there's a lot of ways to do that. And there's certain realities of offering services and being a community-based model. Uh, I still have a lot to learn in this sector, uh, certainly on the public side. Uh, there are a lot of uh, regulatory requirements. There are a lot of processes that are already in place, a lot of great processes that are in place here. Uh, the Quality Assurance Program, the department that's here now, has a whole set of objectives, milestones, and deliverables that goes across every department here. Those are a great bedrock program to see already in place here. Uh, learning how that works uh, is probably an area I can grow in. How we tie that area, other than organizational and council goals, I think it still has tremendous opportunity. Board, an opportunity for a question? Um, disclosure, uh, I have a daughter who lives on Hillside Drive. Oh, uh, great. And uh, they like it because they have a lot of homes nearby, but no neighbors, really. So it's pretty quiet often. Um, how, do you, how do you address or how do you keep the community involvement in, in activity when most of the community isn't there, but maybe 17 or a, a small percentage of the time? Yeah. It's, um, it's turned out to be a tremendous advantage. Um, and, and different than maybe you'd think, right? Maybe I'm setting this up wrong, <laughs> not deliberately. <laughs> but when I think um, it's nice to have a quiet neighborhood, uh, Hillside's a great area, it's a sunny area, and it's a, a nice quiet street. Um, uh, some of our more engaged homeowners live on that street and a couple of other streets, it's uh, interesting. Um, but what I've found is that on the private side, um, we've able, been able to and almost uh, have been forced to, or I won't say forced to, but have gravitated to, I have, with building a strong marketing arm, a strong communication arm, because with our model being 70-30, we really rely upon that 70% revenue to make it all work, to pay all the bills. So when you want to attract and get people to come use the amenities and activities and resources that we are offering and pay a fee to do it, we can't, we, we weren't just gonna rest on our loyals, the, the, they're just gonna show up when they show up. We try to create programs and niches and opportunities and tailored service and programs and outreach to them at their primary homes on a regular basis to try to attract them and create their connection back with their ownership interest and just rather than a couple days or a couple holidays, trying to create the excitement where they want to be there on a regular program, on a regular iteration, more often and more frequent than perhaps they would do on their own. And it's just being that presence and being aware and having that communication connection with them on a regular basis, I think has been very successful for us. And you, you call it marketing, it is. And, but we're marketing to our members, to our owners, to our citizens, not just the masses of, you know, the massive tourist influx population. That's good and important for a community like this too. Uh, but, you know, we find that we've got to balance that with a little bit of, you know, what we call over tourism and trying to find that, that right balance of getting everybody back to the community as often as possible through marketing communication efforts about the excitement being part of Tahoe, being part of Tahoe Donner, the pride of ownership and the pride of the service level that's provided. Um, that has, I think, been very successful for us. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mr. Ednard, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate you coming thank to you. Aspen and interviewing with us and, and your presentation today. Um, that's all we have for now, and we will see you again this afternoon. Great. So have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all very much. Thanks. We appreciate it. And thank, thank you for you. showing up today. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.